Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for your patience. This is the Berlin Epi Methods Colloquium. My name is Jess Roman. Uh, the BEMC is run by myself, Tobias Kurt, and Bob Zinkerink. Uh, we're very, very pleased to have you here today, and we're very pleased to have a special speaker joining us. Um, at the moment, I believe, located in Dublin, originally from Norway. Um, he'll tell you a little bit about his background and his trajectory. Um, but of note, originally uh, you were a medical doctor, trained as a medical doctor, um, has a degree in epidemiology from Harvard. Uh, we had already in the past as a speaker in the BEMP, Jamie Robbins. So for those of you who were there for that, I think you'll find today's talk especially interesting. Um, and we also have Miguel Hernan coming in a few weeks. So I think uh, your piece in, in conjunction with some of these speakers will be interesting to those who are following along. We also, several of us who participated in the Journal Club last month, read uh, your recent article, and I'm hoping there will be some good questions uh, tying into today's lecture from that piece as well. Um, what else can I tell you? For those who have not been here before, we're doing this every month, Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month at 4 p.m. in this space, as long as they don't lock us out. And we do the Journal Club the third Wednesday of the month, over at the Neurology Building. So come talk to me, grab a flyer if you're unfamiliar, and uh, without further ado, please give it up for Anders Hutfeld. Am I saying it correct? It's not pronounceable in any other way. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so, thank, you. thank you. Right, so thank you so much for that introduction, Jess. I don't think I have much to add to that. Um, you've, uh, you've heard from both of my doctoral supervisors, Miguel and Jamie, or you're hearing from Miguel soon, so uh, what I'm doing is, I mean, everything I know I learned from them, and uh, what I'm saying here is trying to build a little bit on that to, uh, in order to say something about how we generalize research from uh, findings from one group of people to a different group of people. So I've proposed a new method for that based on what I call counterfactual outcome state transition parameters. And the last half of my presentation, I'm going to try and explain what they, those parameters do. But before I do that, I'm going to have to summarize some of the motivation for that in terms of the background literature and why I disagree with both of the other ways of doing it that are, that are common in the, in the current methodological literature and in the current applied literature. So. Um, Really, a lot of this presentation, more than being about the generalizability of randomized trials, is going to be about what it means for the effect of a drug to be equal in one group of people to the effect in another group of people. What does it mean to say that the effect in one group of people is equal to, to, to the effect in another group of people? That is really, it sounds like a very philosophical question, but what I'm going to argue is that when we do research, how we answer that question is going to depend, is going to determine uh, what inferences we make in terms of how the research is going to guide our cl clinical decision making later. So we need to have a very clear answer to that because we cannot get around it. If we have one answer, we're going to make a completely different clinical decision based on the research from, from if we have a different answer. So I start every talk that I give by invoking something called Crocker's Rules, meaning that I'm asking you as a personal favor to me to be as rude and direct as possible in your feedback so that I maximize the amount of information that I receive from you. Uh, that does not mean I'm allowed to be rude to you. It's something I do for myself, uh, telling you that if you offend me, that's my problem and I've allowed you to do it. And I'm considering that a personal favor. So p please feel free to stop me and interrupt me at any point if anything is unclear during this presentation. Okay. <clears throat> so any attempt to generalize the findings from a randomized trial, which was done in a specific study population, uh, to a clinical setting, for example, a clinically relevant target population, is going to have to depend on a background belief that something is equal between the study population and the target population. Okay. So that can be that we believe a conditional effect parameter is equal between those two groups of people. But as we will show, there are many different choices we can make in terms of what specific effect parameter we believe is equal, and that's going to determine something about, our, uh, something about what decision we Uh, and 
I'm gonna use, I'm gonna sometimes talk about effect homogeneity and sometimes talk about effect heterogeneity, but these are just the opposite of each other. Homogeneity means that the effect is equal between two groups and heterogeneity means that it's different. Um, sometimes it's more natural to use the first word and sometimes the second. So regardless of how specifically we define homogeneity, it, it's something that can occur between two groups that are both in the study population. For example, I can claim that the effect is equal between the men in the study population and the women in the study population. That is something I can test and check in my data set. Or I can claim that if I take the men in the study population, then their effect is equal to the men in the target population. That is something I cannot test because I do not have data from the target population. And I, uh, so really that's, that's the kind of homogeneity that we'll be relying on when we try to generalize and extrapolate out of the sample that we have, okay? So traditionally when we thought about effect homogeneity and heterogeneity in, uh, in epidemiology and in clinical medicine, we, uh, we thought about which things determine the magnitude of the effect, what things determine the effect size. Uh, and then we would assume that once we have accounted for all of the effect modifiers, then within levels of those effect modifiers, uh, there would, you would be able to take what you saw in the study population and apply it in the target population. But this is a problematic way of setting things up because your conclusions are going to depend on which specific effect parameter you chose and we don't have a real principal way of choosing between them, okay? So if I say I think the effect size is probably determined by age and sex and that specific gene, then that might, that might sound plausible, but at the same time, there's nothing in that argument that tells me that this argument works better for the risk ratio scale than the risk difference scale. So it applies equally, the argument applies equally on every scale, but it can only be true at a, on at most one scale because it cannot mathematically, you cannot mathematically get homogeneity on more than one scale if the baseline risks differ between the populations. Okay? So a convincing argument for homogeneity has to be specific to the scale that we're working on. Okay. So now I'm going to come with, give you my formal setup. So we have data from a, a randomized trial on the effect of drug A on binary outcome Y in a study population. So the study population, the, the variable for that is called P and it takes the value S if it's the study population and, and uh, T if it's the target population. It's a little clunky, but um, that's the one we used in the paper and I don't want to change it now. So we are in a situation where the drug that we're interested in is not available in the target population, meaning we know for sure that nobody in the target population took the drug, and that's gonna be relevant for our setup. So because we have a randomized trial in the study population, we're able to know what happens to those people if they don't take the drug. That's just gonna be their, the average outcome in the placebo arm. And we can tell what happens to them if they take the drug that's going to be the, uh, the distribution of outcomes in the active arm. And we also, in the target population, because nobody took the drug, we know what happens to those guys if they don't take the drug. That's just going to be what you, uh, the distribution of outcomes that you observed in those people. And we have now three pieces of information, and we're going to try and predict the fourth, what happens to people in the target population if they do take the drug, if I intervene and give them the drug. We have three pieces of information that can be put together in different ways and will produce diff there's a puzzle with three pieces. The three pieces can be put together in different ways. The specific way you put them together is basically your homogeneity assumption. That's the, that's the background subject matter knowledge that you're relying on in order to make valid inferences about what happens in the target population if they take the drug. Okay, so a number of different definitions of effect homogeneity have been proposed. The traditional ones took an effect parameter in the study population and said the effect is equal if that effect parameter is equal in the target population. And that could be the risk difference, the risk ratio, or the odds ratio. And that group of, that type of effect homogeneity um, that includes all of those three, I'm gonna call effect homogeneity in measure. 
there's a measure of effect that is equal between two groups of people, or more, more than two groups of people in some cases. So recently, in the methodological literature, the focus has shifted to a very different kind of homogeneity assumption that uh, Stewart and Cole call, um, call exchangeability between populations, and that Barn, Boehm, and Pearl call S ignorability. This type of assumption, Tyler Vanderbilt called effect homogeneity in distribution. Basically, what this type of assumption uh, does is um, this here YA is a counterfactual that tells you what happens to an individual if they take or don't take the drug. And you can understand that as what happens to a person if they are. So the one, if they take the drug, you can, take, you can understand that as the distribution of, you can understand that as their outcome if they're in the active arm of a trial. So this, when you think about this type of assumption, this type of condition, you can think about it as saying that the effect, if you do a randomized trial in Norway, and you want to know this at the apply in Germany, not only would you have to have the risk ratio or the odds ratio be equal between Norway and Germany, you would have to have everything that happens in the active arm be equal between Nor Norway and Germany, and also have everything that happens in the placebo arm be, be equal between Norway and Germany. That's a much stronger assumption, and it will imply all of the effect homogeneity and measured uh, uh, conditions. So because there are problems with each of these definitions, my own definition is called homogeneity of counterfactual outcome state transition parameters, and that's going to be the focus of most of this talk after I first talk a little bit about the shortcomings of, the, of both of these earlier ideas. So in general, what everything here has in common is that they take a mathematical object, something that can have, it's a number that, you know, where the size of the number says something about the magnitude of the effect, and it says that it's equal between two groups of people. And then it conditions on a, on a set of, on V, which are the effect modifiers, and those are the things that determine the size of, of the number. So there are two components. There's a set of covariates that you have to condition on, and there's a specific mathematical object that is equal between two groups. And really, in order to plausibly argue for any of these conditions, you have to have a convincing way of reasoning about what, are, what is V and what is the mathematical object that's equal. And these, this argument has to be specific. It has to make sense between. You can't do those two things separately. Yeah. So if any of those conditions hold, then we have a solved problem. It's easy then to prove a standardization formula that will give you valid inferences about the target population. And I'm not going to focus on the mathematics of those standardization formulas. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to make the point here that um, I'm trying to make the point that we really, the, the key to understanding which approach is correct will depend to a large degree on how good of an argument we can make that a specific homogeneity condition holds in the specific setting that you're interested in. Okay. So effect homogeneity measure. Every, if you are not very much into the methods literature, then everything you know about effect homogeneity really is about effect homogeneity and measure. Everything that's been done traditionally from uh, Cochrane's Q, I squared statistics from just looking at forest plots to, to everything you've learned about effect measure modification. That's all about effect homogeneity and measure and it's how everyone has thought about it for the last hundred years until, until, until uh, Pearl and Barnboim came along. There are problems with this because you don't know which effect measure to use and we don't have a principal way of choosing between them. Uh, the effect measures do not have a biological interpretation in most cases. They, some of them may make predictions outside of valid probabilities. Uh, the big one is called asymmetry. That's a problem specific to the risk ratio. It's asymmetry to the coding of the outcome variable. Now this was pointed out uh, in a classic 1958 paper in New England Journal of Medicine called Shall We Count the Living or the Dead? 
by Mendel C. Sheps, who was a medical doctor and later statistician uh, who was at Harvard when she wrote this. Uh, it's a classic paper that has almost all of the intuition that I'm later using in my approach. Uh, and it got into the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, but nobody really listened to her. And I don't know why that is. It could be because she was a woman working in statistics in 1958. That seems plausible. It's also plausible that nobody understood her because nobody understands me either. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know. But the problem here of asymmetry to the coding of the outcome, to whether we count the living or the dead, is that when I take it, when someone constructs a data set, they make a decision, should I code the people who die as one and the people who survive as zero, or should I code the people who survive as one and the people who die as zero? Someone makes that arbitrary decision that shouldn't matter to anything. And the choice that they make here is going to, is going to actually have consequences at the point where someone uses your research. They're going to reach a different decision depending on what choice they make. And that's very deeply problematic for the risk ratio. It is one of the reasons that many statisticians prefer the odds ratio, but that is not, in my view, a good argument. And uh, for more detail on that, you can see my conversations with Frank Harrell on Twitter. Um, but um, it is a real problem with the risk ratio, and one I believe I have, to a large extent, resolved. So we can think about this as there being two different risk ratios, the one for, for survival and the one for death. They're two, just two different effect parameters. Okay. So partly because of these problems and partly because it works better with graphical thinking, what's become common in the last 10 years is something called effect homogeneity and distribution. So this, these have only been developed in the last 10 years. It includes selection diagrams and inverse probability weighted methods for transportability. And they've got a lot of attention in the methods literature. Uh, a lot of papers that have been published, uh, and it's where all of the energy of the methods community has been uh, directed uh, for, for quite a while. So it's trying to resolve the same problem by defin defining effect homogeneity as this S ignorability where you, where you compare what happens in the active arm with what happens in the active arm in the other country, and do that separately for the active arm and the control arm. Now, that just abandons effect measures altogether. It doesn't have a role for effect parameters. So if it's true that if this condition actually uh, holds, then it doesn't matter which effect parameter we use. Any of them will give the correct answer. Um, so this is an elegant and mathematically sophisticated approach. But what I'm trying to argue is that if we do it this way, then V has to be a much, much larger set. It has to include much more covariates, so that it's almost unthinkable to me that we'll ever be able to make this condition hold in reality. OK, so here's an example of, a, of a, basically a DAG. They call it a selection diagram, where we're interested in transporting the effect from A sorry, from, population, from the study population to the target population. And we can do that if we're able to de-separate Y from P, and we can do that by, controlling, by conditioning on V. So if this is the selection diagram, then we get the kind of effect homogeneity and distribution that Pearl and Bernboim talk about, and everything seems like it's fine. But this diagram makes very, very strong assumptions. Because remember, in the past, I t uh, sorry, I told you that in the past, the objective has been to control for those variables that determine effect size. Here, the goal is to control for those variables that determine risk. Everything that causes Y has to be part of V here if it differs between the study population and the target population. So, um, if, if there exists anything, if Y is death, if there exists anything that causes death that differs between two groups of people, unless that variable is, very, is equally distributed between every population of interest, then we have to control for it. That's a much stronger aim. We're aiming to do something much more difficult than controlling for those things that determine how big the effect is. Okay, so that's why I feel it's important that we find some way of, of salvaging the idea of effect modification based on measures because I don't think there's any way we will ever control for 
um, every cause of death or every cause of the outcome. Okay, so um, all approaches based on effect homogeneity and distribution incorporate into, into their methodology this idea that we can find, that we can control for a set V that has every cause of the outcome in it that differs between the study population and the target population. And it abandons the idea of finding a set V that is sufficient to stabilize the effect size. So I'm going to give you this Russian roulette example very soon. Let me just skip this for now. Um, if we believe that this condition holds effect homogeneity and distribution, we would be justified in doing a separate meta-analysis in the active arm and call that the uh, the treatment effect in the or sorry call that what happens to people if they're treated, and do a separate meta-analysis in the in the um, in the placebo arm and just not do anything together. We, we can just do each thing separately. We can do that because we have an assumption that we've stabilized, that we have sufficient covariates we've conditioned on. Um, so we're replacing the actual randomization with a modeling assumption that we've controlled for every class of the outcome, which is really a weird way to go. Um, but if that is what you're trying to do, let me be very clear. If what you're trying to do is instead of controlling for every determinant of effect size, if what you're trying to do is instead to control for every cost of the outcome and you want to standardize the outcome from one population to another, there's no question at all that what Pearl is doing and what Stuart and Cole are doing is mathematically the only correct way of doing it. I'm just saying that you're trying to do something very weird the way you've set up your problem requires you to have an enormous set V of every cause of the outcome, and there's no way anyone will ever be able to do that, and you're throwing away randomization by doing that. Okay. So before I start talking about the counterfactual outcome state transition parameter, we're going to choose our own adventure here. Okay. So for many generations, your home world has been haunted by very bad generalizations of uh, causal effects. And there's a prophecy that there's a chosen one who will be a student of epidemiology and who will save your home world from these bad generalizations. And it looks like it's you. Um, so you are going to have to make a choice. You can apprentice to Emperor Pearl and learn how to reason about generalizability in terms of direct acyclic graphs. Uh, and then you go to page 29. Or we can have a chat with Jedi Master under Skywalker and attempt to salvage the traditional idea of effect modifiers. Which one do you want to go do first? We have a counterfactual time machine, so we're going to be able to do, go both directions here. Um, <coughs> So maybe we just do the, the one with Pearl first, because that's the next slide. Uh, okay. So after many, many years of training with Emperor Pearl, you begin to glimpse the true glory of his DAG theory. And then suddenly, your home world is invaded by, uh, by hostile aliens, or also homeopaths. These are really bad aliens. And the aliens are selling diluted water, which they claim reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. And you think this is really bad. You have to convince everyone that these aliens, they're up to no good. So you do a trial in men, and you find out, as you suspected, that this homeopathy has no effect. So you ask yourself, can I extrapolate these findings to the women in my village? And you think very closely about everything your master told you. And you realize that, no, you can't do that, because there are so many causes of death that differs between men and women. And there's no way that I can incorporate my belief that the effect size is equal between men and women. The only way I can solve the problem using the graphs is to control for every cause of death that differs between men and women. It doesn't matter. It's a null effect. The DAG just doesn't have a way of incorporating anything about an effect size. OK. So there's an, I can't do anything, and the aliens win. My, my, I can't make the generalization, I can't convince anyone, uh, and my planet is helpless to defend itself, and the chosen one failed. 
So now we can use our counterfactual time machine and go back and have a talk with uh, the yet yet I muster instead. Okay. I don't know anything about Star Wars, so I just used some random planets and uh, <laughs> I just wanted a cultural, what was it called? Like a, okay. So the tyrannical Darth Vader has just invaded Naboo. And there's a massive problem with overpopulation. So his advisors tell him to make everyone play Russian roulette every fifth year. And he asks a scientist, give me, evaluate this, give me an evidence-based recommendation for whether this intervention works. So the scientists conduct a randomized controlled trial and they find that among the people who didn't play Russian roulette, 10% died over five years. And among the people who played Russian roulette, 25% of people died. Now this corresponds to something about so you see that there's something about one-sixth that is coming into this data. You know that in a Russian roulette, there are six chambers of which one is loaded. If we take, if 10% of people would have died anyway, and then on top of that, we make them play Russian roulette, we would expect that one-sixth of those who didn't die if they play Russian roulette will die if they play it. That's why you get 25%. These numbers are very specific, and they match up with your structural understanding of the problem. Okay. So in a galaxy very far away, uh, this is actually our own galaxy, I believe, the Borg Queen has just assimilated Vulcan. Now, on Vulcan, people live really long. I think Spock was 200 years old. So only 4% of people are expected to die over the course of five years, and this is a catastrophe for the Borg Queen, who wants young drones. So the Borg Queen asks Darth Vader, can you tell me what happened on your world when you tried this thing about Russian roulette? This sounds like an exciting proposal that I might want to try on Vulcan. Okay. So Darth Vader can answer in several different ways. He can give the Borg Queen the risk ratio or the risk difference or the, odd, the, the odds ratio or the survival ratio, which is the risk ratio where the... Um, where the coding of the outcome has been reversed. And each and every statement that I have here that calculates one of these effect parameters is completely valid and true for what Darth Vader saw on Naboo. There's nothing, there's nothing to prefer one over the other to describe what happened in Naboo. But if you use this information to carry in, if you use this data to carry information to Vulcan about what you expect will happen there, it will result in different empirical predictions. Okay. So if we use the risk ratio, we pr pr predict that 10% will die. If we use the odds ratio, we predict that 11.1% will die. If we use the risk difference, we predict that 19% will die. And if we use the survival ratio, we present that 80% will survive, meaning that 20% will die. At most, one of these predictions can be true. It's not possible that each of these four statements are true about Vulcan. But only the one for the survival ratio corresponds to what you would get if you did the same maths as, you did, as we did. To, if, we ta if we believe 4% will die if they don't play Russian Roulette on Vulcan, and there's still a one-sixth probability of dying if you play Russian Roulette, you will get 20%. There's something that the survival ratio got right here, because it's the only one that has a way of encoding the structural parameter of 5 over 6, which is what matters to the extrapolation. <clears throat> okay? So only one of these parameters has a structural meaning, and it's not a coincidence that that's the one that gives you a meaningful result. So things may not be that simple. Vulcan might, may have a big alcohol problem, so people who, uh, they may have a lot of Romulan ale there. So people who play Russian roulette on Vulcan may be more likely to miss. So that gives you local deviation from five over six, from one over six, or five over six, which are just you know two different ways of saying the same thing. Or it might be that there are more likely to have seven chambers of revolvers on Vulcan, and you'd have to control for for which revolver they use. But once you control for everything that determines the structural effect parameter on the scale that corresponds to your background beliefs, you maybe actually have confidence in your predictions. 
But note that it's not possible to find anything you can condition on to make the normal risk ratio stable. It's only because, of, because we're working on the survival ratio scale that we have a place to put 5 over 6 as a structural parameter. Okay, so when we extrapolate from the blue to Vulcan, we have to condition on all the things that determine effect size. Um, and if we account for all the factors that determine the magnitude of the treatment effect on a scale that has structural meaning, we may begin to have confidence in our extrapolations. But the reasoning will be specific to that scale. Nothing you can do to make the risk ratio stable. So then Emperor Pearl comes back and he joins the discussion and he says, why don't you just take the risk of death if treated from Naboo and standardize that to Vulcan? Then you can forget everything about which effect measure to use and everything about what happened to the people who didn't play Russian roulette because their risk of death at 10% is not relevant according to my graphs. And he's completely correct. You could do that if you were able to account for every cause of death that differed between the two planets. But that's a very weird goal to have. The mathematics would be correct if that's what you're trying to represent, that mode of reasoning. It doesn't mean that it's a reasonable thing to do. So, okay, so he claims any attempt to solve this problem using an effect measure to carry information is parametric and therefore some, somewhat questionable because we have a complete non-parametric solution to the problem and that should be enough for everyone. Okay, so in this argument, the word non-parametric is doing a lot of work because it's become a dirty word to Perl. But as I showed you, you wouldn't be able to solve this problem if you used this method, and you might be able to solve it using reasonable beliefs about the background uh, structural process. Okay, so that's the motivation for my counterfactual outcome state transition parameters. Five over six is an example of a counterfactual outcome state transition parameter associated with the effect of playing Russian roulette. I introduced this model as a way to reason about choice between effect measures. Um, and the idea was to preserve the traditional idea of finding a way to control for the things that determine the magnitude of the effect instead of having to control for every cause of the outcome. So what they are, they are the probabilities, they are effect measures based on the probability of switching outcome state in response to treatment. So the first one is called G, it's defined as the probability of, uh, it's a probability of dying if treated, if you're someone who would have died if non-treated. It's actually the probability of not switching in response to treatment, because that's the way I made them uh, more trivially equal to risk ratios and survival ratios. H is, the, is working in the different direction. It's the probability of not being a case under treatment among those who would have been cases under no treatment. Would not, right. So if you, if, you, if you take people who, if you look at what happens to people if they don't take the treatment, and for the people who, in that group of people, okay, you look at people who, you consider what happens to people if they don't take treatment, and you divide them into the people who would have had the outcome and the people who wouldn't have had the outcome. Then these parameters are going to be equal to the probability of, of not switching if you give them the treatment. So in the case of Russian roulette, five over six is then the probability of, uh, of not switching, of not going from alive to dead when you move from the counterfactual world where you don't play Russian roulette to the counterfactual world where you play it. And that's the only way to get the structural parameter files, to get five over six into your causal model, into your causal notation and allow it to play a role in the analysis. There's no other way of getting that figure, five over six, into the analysis. And then can, unless you do that, it can't carry the information. And that's what you had to do in order to be able to transport the effect. Okay. So you can interpret H and G, respectively, as the, as the probabilities of not switching from alive if untreated 
to treat it or from that if untreated to that if treated. There are probabilities that say something about whether you switch when you, when you move from one counterfactual world to another. So if these structural parameters are equal between two groups of people, you can write that in counterfactual form as an independence between what happens if treated between two populations, conditional on what happens if not treated. And as I show in my paper in Epidemiologic Methods from 2018, this definition of effect equality resolves every problem with the normal uh, measures of effect. The underlying parameters are symmetric to the coding of the outcome variable. They are collapsible. They don't have any zero constraints. They do not make predictions side set of valid probabilities. And they're not baseline risk dependent. And they also have a biological interpretation. So if there's a drug, sorry, if there's a gene that determines whether a drug switches, uh, whether a drug has any effect or not on people, and that gene has equal distribution between two groups of people, then that will lead to, that will lead to something like equality of counterfactual outcome state transition parameters. So the drawback from the setup is that the counterfactual outcome state transition parameters are not identified from the data without further assumptions. And in particular, you need something called monotonicity. <laughs> what monotonicity means is that the drug only works in, not, in one direction. If there exists a person who benefits from the drug, there does not exist a person who's harmed by the drug. If there are some people who benefit and some people who, who are harmed, then these parameters aren't really that useful. They cannot be identified and therefore you know, cannot be relied upon for your extrapolation. So if you use this method, you have to think very carefully about whether monotonicity holds in your specific situation. But you cannot make a general argument that you don't believe monotonicity. You have to consider it for each and every application of the method. So one way I like to illustrate this is that if you have, if you're interested in the effects of amiodarone, a drug that's supposed to work against arrhythmia, that drug is known to, in some people, cause arrhythmia. So it works in both ways. It's not uh, monotonic. And for that outcome, uh, let me finish the sentence. And for, that, for that outcome, you cannot assume monotonicity. But it also, it's known to cause pulmonary fibrosis. And it's very unlikely to me that any person is prevented from getting pulmonary fibrosis by taking amiodarone. So, it's, so in that setting, it very likely has a monotonic effect. It only harms people and never hurts people from that specific outcome. And that's probably going to be the case for most rare side effects. There are very few drugs that prevent people from getting the rare side effects that they cause. Uh, there was a question here? No. So the implication in practical terms of this model is that in most settings, you should be using the version of the risk ratio that is between zero and one, meaning that if you're interested in a drug that reduces the risk of an outcome, you should be using the normal risk ratio and report a number between zero and one. If you are interested in a drug that harms people or that increases the outcome, you should be using the survival ratio, which will also then be between zero and one. That is not a full, uh, I mean, that's not a full, that, that is just like a rule of thumb that arises in many settings if you think through all of the causal model that's underlying this. But it's something, um, but it is actually a conclusion that has arisen independently many times in the literature from people working from the same intuition as me. What I've done is simply to add a formal causal model to intuition, starting with the works of Sheps who said the same thing, so that we can uh, put everything in terms of maths and reason clearly about the scope and limitation of that line of reasoning. But even in the Cochrane Handbook, they make a very similar suggestion as this, saying that you should use the normal risk ratio for things that produce the incidence. They don't go far, as far as say you should use the, uh, the survival ratio, the reverse risk ratio for things that increase the incidence. They just don't make a recommendation for that. But that intuition has arisen multiple times. 
That's, um, and the first component of this prediction was confirmed empirically by, uh, by Deeks in 2002. But if you want to test these predictions empirically, there are problems because the tests for heterogeneity have different power and different scales. So it's very hard to compare the results between scales. Okay. So in this paper that I'm pushing very hard and trying to get everyone to read because she's saying the same thing as me, uh, Shall We Count the Living or the Dead? That's a classic where Shep said the same thing in 1958 in my work. It's essentially a causal model that says the same thing because causal models didn't exist back then. Now this other paper, an evidence-based approach to individualizing treatment by Paul Glasio and Les Irving from, from BMJ in 1995 had essentially the same recommendations as me, except it said to use the risk ratio, the normal risk ratio for things that produce the incidence and to use the risk difference for things that increase the incidence. The reason that I'm saying that this is essentially the same recommendation is that when the outcome is rare, the risk difference is essentially equal to the survival ratio. Um, so what I add is a formal counterfactual model for this, and it's been published across the papers uh, which are listed here. Um, and there's recently also been a response from Perl, uh, which is available in a preprint form and which I'm working to review at the moment. So in the future, I'm hoping to propose new measures of meta-analytic heterogeneity that are stable between different scales so that I can test the empirical predictions that we're better off using the risk ratio for things that produce the incidence and the survival ratio for things that increase the incidence. And I have a number of other plans going forward for working on, uh, for extending this model beyond binary outcomes and to other settings. So I focused on two major points where methodologists can reasonably disagree with each other. Now the first one is, should we consider homogeneity and heterogeneity in terms of stability of measures of effect or in terms of stability of counterfactual distributions? And mathematically, both are valid. Um, but if we go for the counterfactual distributions, that implies that we're going to have to measure and control for every cause of the outcome. So both when I talk to uh, people in, who are applied researchers and when I talk to hardcore but traditionally trained st statisticians, meaning people who are not in the causal inference community, they will all think it's obvious that I'm right that we have to focus on effect measures. But everyone in the, the causal inference methodology community have gone this way of focusing on counterfactual distributions. That's just where all of the, of the focus and uh, attention is at the moment. So the second point of this, it's very hard for me to imagine what made people go this, this way of focusing on the counterfactual distributions. It may be just, you know, it may be that it's just for people who are trained in graphs, it corresponds more closely to how we think about confounding so the methods translate better. Uh, that might be one reason. But it's worth noting that the only people who are going this direction are the kind of fact, are the cost modeling methodologists, and not they haven't convinced either the normal, the non-cost inference statisticians, or they've convinced uh, the applied researchers. Okay. So the second point of the second point of discussion is if you agree with me that we should be thinking about effect measures instead of counterfactual um, distributions. Then, our, then, then is my method any good for determining which effect measure we should use? And that's something that's much more up for this. I mean, that's something where it's much easier for me to imagine why people would disagree, but I'm hoping for feedback on people, from people who read my model and understand how it works on, on why that argument may not fully capture um, all of the things that go into how they think that we should be choosing effect measure. Okay, so my final slide here is a quote from a paper by Tyler Hill, which was the first one to introduce the distinction between effect homogeneity in measure and effect homogeneity in distribution. And what he wrote 10 years ago is that definition three concerning effect homogeneity, uh, effect modification and distribution is fairly trivial insofar as if the potential effect modifier has any effect whatsoever on the outcome, 
then there will in general be effect modification and distribution even if the exposure has no effect on the outcome. We do not advocate the use of definition three in practice, but employed in this paper simply as to draw the appropriate parallels on distinctions with confounding. That was what Tyler wrote when he introduced the distinction in the first place. But since then, this definition three has become the found, founding foundational assumption, the foundational, like the thing, the assumption, the condition that all of the work is proceeding from, and almost all of the methods work that's gone into effect heterogeneity. Um, and that's a very weird thing to have happened, and uh, I've been trying to argue that point for a while now. So I hope I was able to be more convincing at this presentation than, than at my previous attempts, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure, we have some good questions, and Bob and I are going to try to find the lights.